Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. I'm Susan Derwin. Um, I direct the Humanities Center, which is the sponsor of the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program, and I also direct the program itself. And I'm very appreciative that you're all here to learn about the work that our two fellows have done, and I'm confident that you're going to be inspired and impressed by their accomplishments. Um, I also want to introduce Erin Nurstead, if you don't already know Erin. Erin uh, is the IHC Associate Director, and she also um, teaches in the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program and oversees the program coordination. We also have Chris on screen, who's our Assistant Director, who's involved in everything. Um, so uh, allow me before we begin to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located, and also to pay respect to elders past and present, as well as other indigenous people who may be present. So um, you may know or may not that the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program is independent of any single academic program um, it brings together PhD students from across the humanities and humanistic social sciences, and it builds upon the resulting interdisciplinary synergy through coursework and a practicum that prepares fellows for careers as socially engaged humanists, both within and beyond the academy. Fellows in the program complete two seminars. The first addresses the history, theories, and methodologies associated with the public humanities and studies the emergence and history of the public university. The second seminar helps students acquire the skills they need to do the work in the public sphere, including how to communicate skillfully with diverse groups and communities and how to build sustained relationships with community partners. In this skills course, fellows also develop digital skills, they study grant writing and budget creation, and they gain an understanding of project management. In addition to coursework, the Public Humanities Fellows complete either a community-based internship or a fellow-designed community project. They work with cultural organizations and foundations, community centers, governmental offices, community colleges, and K through K-12 schools. And finally, each fellow participates in a capstone event, such as today's, which is a public presentation in which they discuss the work they have done in the program and the ways in which that work has made a difference in their professional lives. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first public humanities graduate fellow, Morgane Tonart. Morgane is a PhD candidate in the Department of Religious Studies, focusing on American Muslim ethicist stand-up comics. Her doctoral dissertation explores questions of representation, ethics, and religious authority through the comic discourse, and her research aims to contribute both to public conversation and to scholarship on the nexus between religion and humor, and religious humor in particular. Welcome, Morgane. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Professor Derwin, for these kind words of introduction. Thank you, really, for being here today. So as Professor Derwin said, I am a doctoral candidate in the Department of Religious Studies here at UCSB. My research interests lie in the funny business of religious definition. My dissertation specifically examines the ways in which American Muslim comedians articulate a form of religious discourse and practice through humor. And as Professor Derwin said, my goal really is to contribute to public conversation and academic research on the relationship between religion and popular culture in general and religious humor in particular. Thanks to the practicum component of the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program, I had the opportunity to complete a fellow design community project last year in the summer of 2022. My community partner was a nonprofit organization, European Middle East Project, based in Brussels, Belgium. Combining the roles of analytical think tank, advocacy, NGO, and coordination hub, UMAP specializes in promoting just, fact-based, and effective European and international policies on the conflict in Israel and Palestine. UMAP develops policies towards both sides of the conflict based on the respect for international law, 
equal human dignity, freedom, and security for all Palestinians and Israelis. The organization puts analysis and advocacy at the center of its activities while working closely with various civil society organizations and experts across Israel, Palestine, Europe, and beyond. I'd like to invite you, encourage you even, to have a look at UMEP's website to learn more about the important work, but also about the ongoing issues. For my fellow design project with UMEP, I geared several research assignments to best support the organization's future policy work to achieve just and effective peace in the region. My main assignment pertained to the involvement of the United Nations in Israel and Palestine. My main assignment pertained, you know, what, what pertained to this involvement and the goal was to unpack the pervasive narrative of UN bias, which has prompted successive US administrations and some European states even to advocate against UN resolutions. Specifically, my research examined both the contemporary politics and the historical ramification of this narrative, relying on various archives. Through my community-based project, I developed new content expertise, improved my database skills, and learned to effectively use new archives. The project required great flexibility in that the direction of the research evolved according to the specific needs and goals of the organization in terms of analysis and advocacy. Developing the conceptual, theoretical, and methodological approach for the research project was premised on the need for accuracy, fact-based and fact-checked information as I relied on various academic and non-academic archives. The three reports that I completed over the two months of the fellowship represent the foundation, or preface rather, to further policy work. The reports will be used as basis for publication and advocacy, and I, I am very, very excited that these findings could be useful for partners. During the fellowship and my time at, at UMEP, I also sharpened my written communication skills in a different way. In that I aim to reach a people who are actively addressing this urgent issue. And in doing so, I was not using the academic jargon and while the language was much straightforward in a way, precision was very much the key to good work. So I'm immensely grateful for the mentorship I received through the project at UMEP and the IHC. Besides the practicum, the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program has also prepared us for a career as publicly engaged academics through two seminars. The seminars not only gave me new skills and insights into the articulation of the public humanities, they also created a dynamic and inclusive space of engagement where we collectively reflected on our trajectories as public humanists in an interdisciplinary and anti-disciplinary way. The seminar History and Theory of Public Humanities taught by Professor Derwin opened a critical and thought-provoking forum where through meaningful texts and conversation, we exchanged on the centrality of praxis in approaching the sign significance of publicly engaged humanities. We unpack the politics, positions, and relations of knowledge construction and transmission. And in thinking about the humanities, we consider the conditions, configurations, and visions of value and legibility. In our conversations, we unpacked a foundational understanding of our work based on the principles of reciprocity, responsibility, and self-reflection. The seminar, Skills for the Public Sphere, taught by Professor Nurstad, was a very important space where we developed practical skills and insights for different career trajectories within and beyond academia. From public writing to grant writing, from web design to delivering public presentations, I expanded the color palette of my skills. I'm particularly grateful for the several assignments which pushed me out of my comfort zone, such as the conducting of informational interviews. Since the seminar, in fact, I have carried several interviews which have been extremely valuable in think about, thinking about potential career path after the dissertation. I have, for instance, talked to uh, analysts at the International Crisis Group about different career paths outside uh, academia. So why do I consider myself a public humanist? What is the value of public humanities? It is very much in their striving to reach societal transformation through solidarity around shared interests that the public humanities reveal all their significance and meaning. 
We cannot think about the work of the public humanities outside of the exchanges, engagement, and commitments of the different publics to develop collective and collaborative efforts to seek societal transformation based on the principles of community organizing and accessibility. And so in thinking about the road ahead, I want to say that my participation in the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program has been formative, not only formative, but transformative in the ways I approach my research and pedagogical practices in different spaces of engagement. The program has inspired me to rethink my aspiration as a researcher in engaging different communities and audiences, and also reassessing the impact of my work in different non-academic communities. Before pursuing my PhD, I worked in nonprofit, and participating in the Public Humanities Graduate Fellows Program allowed me to work through a disconnect I had felt between my scholarship and my community-grounded work. As I complete my dissertation project, I am now renewing my commitment to community-engaged work and recenter my work on praxis, collaboration, and solidarity. As I continue teaching during my graduate career and hopefully beyond, I want to connect praxis, justice, and knowledge even more centrally in my pedagogical approach. I also want to focus on the importance of critical thinking and analytical skills, which are essential to address important issues we're facing and that are subject to considerable myths and disinformation. That is how I see the road ahead. But for now, I would like to thank once again the IHC for the support and guidance. And of course, thank you all for being here today. Feel free to reach out, connect, and thank you. Thank you so much, Morgane. That was, that was great. All right, so we would love to hear comments, thoughts, questions from other people on the screen. Mm -hmm. So who'd like to start? Thank you, Juan. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to see uh, to our two students here, uh, Esra and Morgan, and uh, these fascinating presentations coming out of their research. And I was wondering, um, public humanities, raises a question in my mind about the differentiation between public humanities and social science. And if you had thought about that and reflected on that, what, you know, what to what degree do you actually see what you were doing as humanities work? Uh, and, or do you see social science intersecting and overlapping with that humanities work? And do you make a distinction in that? Is it the fact that religion is a factor in your, um, in your work? Or where do the humanities come in exactly? That's a good question for both of you. <laughs> yes, for both, both of them. Yes, Morgan. Thank you, Professor Campbell, for your question. Uh, I find the work has been at the intersection of the humanities and the interpretive social sciences. Uh, which I think is part of an interdisciplinary approach to resolve current issues and urgent issues. Um, here, it's, it's, it was grounded in, in methodologies rather from within the humanities in the project I carried for UMEP, uh, more historically grounded and more of a textual analysis in, in looking at a specific issue here. Um, and of course, the, the so the, I would say the theoretical and methodological approach to the project were very much grounded in humanities, um, but in terms also of its approach to solve uh, an issue, it was an understanding of, of, of contemporary society through, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. Uh, maybe as I take it up and I will, I will keep thinking oh, about this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a well, it's something that we puzzle over too. I mean, so, but I I want to hear from you know, your perspective as well to, to help my thinking. <laughs> I think that's a great question. And that's why when I said public humanities program really allowed me to connect ethnography to public humanities. Ethnography is considered as a social scientific research method, but yeah. public humanities is grounded in public. Uh, so my, my, I mean, as a, as a scholar, as a public humanities fellow, my goal is to do interdisciplinary work where we could just, I mean, uh, bring different elements uh, across different um, scholarly um, fields. 
Thank you. So I just want to jump in here for a minute because I, I can't resist. But, you know, one of the ways that I think of what makes this work unique, and it came out in the presentations, is the tremendous focus, value, and cultivation of two things. The first is relationships, that the students, the work that publicly engaged humanists do is responsive to problems and challenges that are identified by the community. That's one thing, rather than the study and identification from sort of, you know, facing outward from the academy. And the second thing that is more implicit, but is a crucial part of both of their projects and all public projects is the cultivation and utilization of tools of representation. Uh, Esra mentioned how loiter is so, how storytelling mm -hmm. is important to Loit loiter. And Morgane's work is in articulating challenges and problems in the Middle East. So, and so much of it is about the power of transparent, available, and compelling communication and representation. So we spend a lot of time talking about how to say things how to formulate things, how to reflect on one's own position and skills so that one can build awareness into all of these, this work. So that, that's one thing I learn and notice that it's about relationships that enable one to respond and about self and representation more, more broadly. So the tools are so crucial. Would you both agree with that? I mean, do you recognize yourselves and the work you've done? And, and so much of our um, pedagogical project, I think, as the instructors in the program, Aaron and, and, and I, are to make the fellows able to recognize and represent what they do. Like so much is taken for granted. And I'm in a, you know, I'm in a, so, you know, oh, I just did an interview. Well, what does that mean? What did you have to do? What skills were you using in order to just do an interview? And so it's becoming aware of what you do also so that you can represent it. And it's really hard for us to study ourselves, you know, not to talk about our feelings, but to talk about our skills and how we move. And so that's why a lot of this program is self-reflection. I mean, through the interviews, uh, the, the internships, we have discussions with the um, interns about their praxis, their journey, what they're learning. So you can sort of, you can substantiate what, what you really do as a, as a humanist. So anyway, I'm sorry if I went on too long, but other, yes, Dwight. Thank you both for wonderful presentations. It sounds like you both un undertook great projects. And my question for each of you is, I wonder if you would be willing to share a few of the most memorable moments from, the, from your projects. And those could be, that could be happy moments, good moments where things really went well. Although as a language teacher, I always tell people you learn more from your mistakes than when things go right. So it might be moments where things didn't go so well, but you learn, or it might just be one of those moments where the light bulb went on and you said, aha, you suddenly came to a realization, you know, through the work you were doing in your project that you did not have before. Would either of you be willing to share? I'm a, I'm a slow thinker, and you and you know it. So I take a minute to 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 come to my uh, to 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 gather my thoughts. But it's like if you want to go, otherwise I can give it a try. Sure. So I like I had an interview with the with one of the co-founders of Loiter. It was like during the very first uh, stage of my um, internship. So during this interview, I actually developed the idea of grassroots public humanities because for me, Ismail, who is the co-founder, uh, one of the co-founders of Loiter, is really like engaging with social concepts that we use in our scholarly fields but he's also claiming himself to be not scholar but he's inside our fields so that was the moment for me to see really like these grassroots movements as a source of social theory uh, so um, yeah my first interview with Ismail I would say 
in thinking about it, one of the major challenges I faced during the, the fellowship in the research is that this particular issue that we were covering is facing so much misinformation and disinformation that it's sifting through decades of scholarship. And as we know, know history and the historiography of the conflict is, is nothing is really fact. And so it's trying to find the facts within perspectives, approaches, and the different biases of, of the authors. And so in trying really to understand what happened, get to the, really to the facts was sometimes really hard um, because it's always compounded with judgment of values and the inherent bias of the author in approaching uh, the, the data at hand. And so sifting through that, understanding what the, narr the narrative was, was, it, was there bias? Was there a UN bias, you know? against Israel, for example, and how does that play out in, in, in the conflict was really took weeks of, of going about and, and checking again and again the data and make sure that everything would be 100% correct because it's building policy work at, 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 in Brussels, like at, at the EU level. Um, and so that was, that was hard. Um, and I think the second challenge was the you know I think sometimes in academia we 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 hide behind the jargon when we don't really know like we're not two hundred percent sure what we're really trying to say we know we're on the right track but here could not hide in the jargon and so many times we I had conversation with with uh, my the director of the NGO is like but what do you mean here what like i need to know exactly i need you to unpack the meaning of the term you're using because it's crucial for how i'm gonna work with it and so that was always sometimes forcing me to take a step back and be like well what did i mean when i say you know i don't uh. so that was a challenge but it was always very rewarding so the, the challenge was at the same time the best moments getting to that that you know eureka moment is like okay i think i know I have, you know, some certain achieving some certainties in the process was very reward, rewarding. Thank you. Yes, please, Magda, please. Hi. Did any of you thought about the the different projects that you worked on because of what you studied or because of what was happening? Uh, in these two situations that you have chosen to work on? Was it something uh, like uh, what you studied that triggered that you wanted to do it or because of what was happening uh, and in combination with what you studied caused it to be a reason to participate into these different projects? Yes, I'm happy to go first. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. So I'm a scholar of religion and racial capitalism. My goal as a scholar was to see, recognize forms of life that are beyond capitalism. As I was looking at different organizations that claim to racial capitalism, Loiter was a really striking example for me. So uh, I was interviewed by the work that they do. While I uh, started to, I mean, uh, have a conversation with members of Loiter because of my research, I'm also consider my, myself as someone who is deeply invested in organizing projects. So they are as, of course, as they are like um, my community partner for my public humanities fellowship. So my inter my interaction with them is just simply beyond my scholarly works. So to sum up my answer, it's because of, it first started because of my scholarly I would have a similar answer. Um, I think that the challenge was pursuing a doctoral program in religious studies. I did a master's in Middle Eastern studies and history and um, in the Middle East, in Israel and, and, and uh, pursuing uh, an academic path to in, in Palestine. And so that, that, that I would say too, that the, the scholarship was, uh, you know, the, the trigger for that project, but I had the opportunity to work 
with UMAP, uh, actually right before starting the PhD, I, I was working with, with them as a research associate. So I, right now, yes, the situation under underground does not, you know, I think requires our attention uh, as well. And so that brought me back, I think the partial, um, I mean, apathy of the international community is leading to a degradation of the situation on the ground. And I think it, it was, I think, yes, working through that disconnect of, of, of the, the, the scholarship that I've been doing and working on humor and, and the situation that requires our attention to um, so both. <laughs> Thank you. Well, in principle, our time is up, but do we have any last reflections or questions um, from anybody else or? Yes, one. Yeah, just, just an observation. It seems to me that um, the humanities can no longer afford to continue to exist in an ivory tower kind of world. And it's very, it's very mm -hmm. evident in so many aspects of our lives, including what's happening on our campus in terms of uh, directions that students are going in in terms of what they decide to study. And it's less and less the humanities, which I think reflects a call for people in the humanities to become much more engaged and much more visible in the public sphere. So your um, the, the IHC's initiative in public humanities, I think, is very critical. And having students like Esra and Morgan engaged in public humanities knowledge production, I think, is crit a critical move and really needs to be affirmed and pursued more and more, I think, and finding ways to bring the humanities into the public sphere is is um, is going to be critical for our, our ability to survive as as humanists, you know, in the generation to come. So thank you, Susan, for you. You know, conceiving of this initiative, Susan, and and your staff. And uh, I just want to indicate the strong support for what you're doing. I I really appreciate it, and I have to say, we are so fortunate to be able to work with these outstanding students from across the division. I mean, it's it's a real joy and privilege. And, you know, they 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 represent, I, I think their work represents the future of the humanities as well. And uh, what, what I love about the work though, is also how it reinvigorates the academy. I mean, the, the crucial social public, I mean, we, are, we this is why we're here to do that integrative work, but you'll notice that they both implicitly we're talking about themselves as learners again and boy when teachers know their learners i think that this vivifies what the university is so i'm i'm grateful to learning from them and and i'm i'm thankful to you for coming today and yes so uh congratulations to both of you and your your bright futures are ours to to watch and support so thank you